Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, that where we dwell together in unity, you command a blessing. And Lord, we receive your blessing this morning. This blessing we've just been singing over one another. Lord, we receive the gaze of your countenance, Lord. We receive your compassion and your favor. Lord, we receive your grace and your mercy. Lord, this morning we receive your peace. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this moment. May your word come alive in our hearts. Would you stir our affections for Jesus today? Lord, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, you all can grab a seat. Whew, that's good. I love, I love God's word. It is so rich. My name's Dan. In case you don't know, I'm one of the pastors here, and I have the joy this morning of continuing the series we've been on for the last few weeks uh, called Rediscovering Joy as we study the book of Philippians. And on week one, you might recall, Tash kicked us off and, and we explored the difference between happiness and joy. And we looked at the, the vast differences between those two and Tash did a great job defining for us what joy is. Then last week, while we were in our Latimer communities, uh, we looked at how Jesus is the source of our joy. He's where we get our joy from. He's where we receive our joy. And this morning, we're going to look at joy from a slightly different um, vantage point, uh, and that is the relational advantage. So I believe that joy is a relational challenge as well. Yes, we receive joy from the Lord, but there is another dynamic, another aspect of joy uh, that comes about when we, as followers of Jesus, as brothers and sisters, learn how to live together in unity. There is joy in unity, and that is a relational joy. So this morning, I have a little challenge for you as we get going. I want you to find a partner. Go ahead, buddy up with someone. Everyone get someone here. You could do this exercise yourself. It'll be a little more challenging. And this is a timed exercise. So I hope you're ready. I'm going to get my stopwatch out. So we're good to go. And here's what I want you to do. Okay. I'm going to give you 60 seconds. And I want, I want you to know that I have confidence in you. That you will complete this challenge in 60 seconds or less. I think all of you are capable of doing this. With the person next to you in 60 seconds. I want you to find one thing that you disagree about, okay? Because there's not enough quarreling in this church. I want to create some, all right? So 60 seconds, one thing you disagree about. Ready, set, go. Nice. Four seconds. Eight seconds, excellent. You guys look awfully happy disagreeing with each other. <laughs> 30 more seconds. You can do it. <laughs> How long did it take you guys? Two seconds. <laughs> you might be the winner. <laughs> All right. 15 seconds. All right, time is up. All right, so real quick, how many of you were able to find at least one thing you disagreed about in 60 seconds? Raise your hand. How many of you could not come up with anything you disagreed about in 60 seconds? Okay, nice. How many of you were not doing the exercise, you were just talking? Okay, <laughs> Okay. now find a different partner, somebody else close by. This time we have a new challenge. 
All right. We got a new challenge this time. This time you only get 30 seconds. All right, everybody got their partner? Okay, here we go. In 30 seconds, find something you agree about. 30 seconds, something you agree about, go. <laughs> Done? Nice. Yes. Nice. Nice, that's great. <laughs> You can do it though, I believe in you. 10 seconds. Ready, stop, okay, that's enough. Now again, how many of you, how many of you could find something you agreed on in 30 seconds? How many of you are talking to someone you're related to and there's no way you're gonna agree on anything in 30 seconds? Okay. <laughs> I see those hands. <laughs> great, great, okay. So what's the point? Why would we do this? Why would we talk, actually before we do that, I wanna hear uh, one group of volunteers about someone, what you disagreed about. Who can volunteer something real quick? Let's just, okay. Yes, Judy, what was your disagreement? We disagreed on liver. You disagreed on liver. <laughs> That's fair, That's fair. Good. <laughs> well done, okay. We disagreed on liver. That's a, that's a good thing to disagree about, I think. All right. Now, how about somebody, something you agreed on real quick? Uh, Izzy and I both agreed that country music is great. Agreed that country music is great. I knew I liked you girls. Yes. <laughs> country music is great. Okay, good. So what's the point? Right? As long as we are, are different people with different personalities making up the church, there are always gonna be things that we disagree about. There are always gonna be areas where we're not in agreement. Uh, but there's also a very unifying thing we all agree about, and that is who Jesus is. And so in churches like any other environment, there's always gonna be different sides of the aisle, if you will. You see how we're kind of set up this morning, we're, we're separated a little bit, and that's intentional because I wanted to demonstrate in a visual way that there will always be different sides uh, because we have different perspectives and we have different personalities and I know what you're thinking. Church would be much easier if everybody was like Dan, right? <laughs> if everyone was like me, wouldn't church be much easier, right? Can you imagine how much we would get done and how quickly we would die from exhaustion? <laughs> no, no, you're not thinking church would be better if everyone was like me. You're thinking church would be better if everyone was like you, right? We, we all tend to think that way. If, if people could just see it from my perspective, they would finally be right, right? That's kind of how we feel. We would never say that because we're too holy, but sometimes we, we think it a little bit. But as long as there are differences, different people, we're going to be different. And the key, right, is to choose to focus not on the things that divide us, but to focus on what unites us. And this is what Paul is encouraging the church in Philippi to do. He's encouraging them to, to find joy again in their relational harmony and unity. We know from the context of this book, we haven't got there yet, but in chapter four, there's a couple ladies squabbling in the church. And I don't know, I'm not saying it has to be ladies, I'm just saying in the Bible it's ladies in this case. Okay, but they're, they're squabbling in the church a little bit and uh, Paul is saying, be of one heart, be of one mind. He's, he's encouraging the whole church to be united as one. John Lubbock said it this way. He said, what we see depends mainly on what we're looking for. Right? Another way to say that is, is you will always see what you're looking for. So when we come together, are we looking for those areas where we're united and agree together, or are we looking for the areas where we disagree, right? Some of you, for example, might think that this soccer sport is better than American football. It's not a real thing, okay, right? But we can, we can agree to disagree on small things, but we can focus on the things that actually really matter. And in this text today, Paul uh, invites the Philippines, uh, the Philippians to say, to make my joy complete. What an interesting statement from the apostle, to make my joy complete. And he encourages them, this is how you're to do it, by being of one heart, by being of one mind, 
right? By, by sharing the same love, by sharing a spirit, you are to make my joy complete. Uh, and before he gets to that, though, there's something interesting he outlines in this passage. Oh, sorry, that's a little too quick, Martha. We'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But there's something in this passage he says at the very beginning where we started reading. He said, live a life that is worthy of the gospel. How many of you have read that before and wondered what it means? How do you live a life that's worthy of the gospel? Well, in this passage, uh, Paul basically tells us, look again at one, uh, Philippians 1, verse 27. He said, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come to see you or only hear about you in my absence, I know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one. So one of the ways we see that Paul is instructing them to live a life worthy of the gospel is in their unity together. And then he goes on and says, uh, do it without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. So there's these two dynamics right here in this passage where Paul instructs the Philippians to live a life worthy of the gospel. And the one thing he encourages them to do is to be unified and the other is to be fearless to be fearless, to be courageous. Uh, we all know that courage is not the absence of fear, it's just doing the right thing in spite of our fear. And so Paul wants this church to be unified and to be courageous, why? Because they may very well suffer persecution just as he is now suffering persecution. You'll remember that Paul is in prison when he's writing this letter and he's encouraging the church in Philippi that when they come together that they've been elected, he said, not just to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for him. Because Paul understood that there was something that happens in shared suffering. And the thing that happens when we share in suffering is we are united, we come together in a way. How many of you have experienced this in your life before? You suffer with someone, you, are, you have such a, a stronger bond than sharing even a thousand laughs with the same person. There's something unifying in suffering. And so Paul encourages the church in Philippi that in your suffering together, stay united, be fearless. Uh, this will help you to live a life worthy of the gospel. And then he says that there's this joy in their unity. And look, let's look at this. So he's connecting that. It says, therefore, in chapter two, anytime you see a therefore or a so, you're recognizing that it's connecting something in the scriptures. And so he's saying, therefore, in light of everything I've just said, about suffering together, about living a life worthy of the gospel, about being united and courageous. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any comfort of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if there is any tenderness or compassion, and, and what we know when Paul is saying if, it, it's kind of that rhetorical. He knows that there is. He planted this church. He, he birthed this church. He knows that this church shares a spirit, shares a heart, has a lot of love. The church in Philippi was not a hot mess like the church in Corinth. They were largely had it together, right? They had a few issues that needed to be addressed, um, but there was encouragement in Christ. There was comfort. Uh, there was a fellowship of the spirit. There was tenderness and compassion between them. And then he instructs them, again, make my joy complete. Make my joy complete. How? How, Paul? How do you want us to make your joy complete? And he lists these things. By being like-minded. By having the same love. By being one in spirit. By having one mind or, or one purpose. By doing nothing according to selfish ambition or vanity, but by valuing others above yourselves. By each one not being concerned about their own interests only, but by being concerned about the interests of others. Can you imagine how much better all of your relationships would be if you just applied those two simple verses? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit but in humility consider others above yourselves, right? Don't look out for your own interests, but also look for the interests of others. Can you imagine how much if you began doing that, it would change some of the dynamics in your relationships, in your workplace, maybe even in the church sometimes, if we would exercise what Paul said? You see, Paul is longing for the church to be united as one. And he understood that what united the church as one was Jesus, it was his life, death, and resurrection. It was what he did for them. It was what brought them together. Now, 
if you have kids, you can relate to this, right? How many of you as parents have said you just want your kids to get along, right? You know, when uh, we were talking just, I think on vacation recently, we were in the car talking and, um, and we're talking about Mother's Day and like, what would you most want for Mother's Day? And she's like, I just want you kids to get along, to not argue, to not bicker and fight. Like, if you would just get along, that's all I want. Me, for Father's Day, I want a big steak on the grill. You can, <laughs> you can argue as much as you want to, as long as that steak is sizzling on the grill, life is good, okay? Now, don't judge which of us is more holy, but I'll tell you now, it's her, okay? But as parents, right, we, it delights our heart when we see our kids loving one another. When we, we see our children preferring each other, it brings such joy to our hearts, but... The converse is also true when they're bickering and arguing and squabbling. It breaks our hearts. How many times have we said, just can't you just get along? Can't you be kind to your sister? Can't you be loving towards your brother? That is in essence what Paul is saying to the church here in Philippi, that this is the one thing that would complete my joy. I have so much joy in you because of your faith and your partnership in the gospel. But the way to complete my joy is by coming together and being unified. Like coming together and being one, this is what Paul wanted for the church. But it's not just what Paul wants for the church in Philippi. It's what Jesus wants for all of his followers. Many of you remember this passage in John chapter 17, when Jesus is saying his final prayer before he's arrested and execute it. He's praying for his disciples and for all those who would come after them. And here's what Jesus prays with the last recorded prayer we have of him. What is he asking the Father for? In John 17, verse 20, he says this. My prayer is not just for them alone. The them he's talking about are his chosen disciples. But I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's you and I sitting here today. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. So be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So see, this is Paul's desire uh, for the church in Philippi. This is Jesus' desire for all his followers to be united as one. And so this morning, we're going to look quickly at three keys uh, to experiencing joy and unity. And the first one is this. Unity can only be brought about by the gospel. Unity that is real and genuine and lasting only comes about because we have a shared uh, rallying point. We have something that we all can agree to and agree on. And I've already mentioned nothing unites the body of Christ like his body broken and his blood spilt for us. This, we remind ourselves when we come to the Lord's table together, which we'll do in a few moments, that when we come and we eat of this bread and we we drink of this juice, that we remind ourselves that Jesus lived a perfect life on our behalf, that Jesus died a selfless death for you and for me, that Jesus experienced a glorious resurrection and his life is what we agree on. We we come together and we believe that, that Jesus really is the hope for the world. That Jesus really is the way, the truth, the life. That Jesus, while we were yet sinners, Paul said, died for us. And this is the thing that unites us as we come together around this table. Everything that divides us falls quiet in his presence. When we uh, come and share communion together, we're reminding ourselves that he who unites us is greater than anything that divides us. What we come together around is the message and the cause of Jesus Christ. And that is the single most unifying thing we'll ever experience in the church. You see, when we come to this table, we're able to set aside our differences and we choose to be united around the ministry of Jesus. We set aside those petty differences. We, we set aside those political preferences. We set aside theological variances. 
and we come together in agreement that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And when we eat this meal together, we are proclaiming Jesus. We are proclaiming him in ourselves. We are proclaiming him to one another. In fact, Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-six 26, that every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. How can we, who are as different as we are, possibly be united? It's because of Jesus. The whole 2,000 year history of the church, when we come to this table, reminds ourselves this is what it's all about. Everything else we get caught up in, everything else we get distracted by, falls to the side as we remind ourselves that we are united as one, as followers of Jesus. There's no shorter distance between two people than the shared love of a savior. You've experienced this before, haven't you? How many of you have ever been on a mission trip before? Yeah, you've been on a mission trip overseas somewhere maybe with a group of random weirdos, right? (laughs) Right, If you've been on a trip before, you've, you've experienced this, that you get these groups of really eclectic, crazy people. And I remember in one particular trip, I won't, I won't call it out in case they're listening to this calling, but you know who you were, Thailand, summer 2013, right? <laughs> we, we went on this trip, and it was just this bizarre group of people. I was, working, I was taking a group of uh, a nonprofit overseas in Thailand to work in the human trafficking industry, and I remember one night sitting around a table with all these people thinking there is literally only one reason in the world why we would all be around the same table, and it's Jesus, I mean, as weird and as different and as crazy as we all are, the only thing that brings us together is Christ. And every time I go out on a team, I'm reminded this is what the church could be like. This is what the church should be like, united together around the person of Jesus and his cause in the world. See, the gospel brings unity. The second thing we need to keep in mind from this passage is that humility is required for unity. So humility is required if we're going to be unified. As we read on in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, picking up where we left off, Paul says this, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, our Father. So here, Paul is encouraging us in all our relationships with one another to lay down our lives as Jesus laid down his life, to give up our rights as Jesus gave up his rights, to set aside our preferences as Jesus set aside his preferences to live and to die for us. See, humility And the great words of of C.S. Lewis, I love this definition, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's simply thinking of yourself less. Humility is uh, an awareness of and a mindfulness of other people and their needs. It's not that you put yourself down. Nobody wants to hear that garbage. You're awesome, God made you, okay? Be you, but also think about others. Paul again said it in Philippians 2 this way, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. How many of you can say you succeeded at that this week besides my wife? No, just her? Okay. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility value others above yourselves. Don't look to your own interest only, but also to the interest of others. Going back to week one, the the pursuit of happiness tells us that we need to look out for the holy trinity of our culture. Me, myself, and I. Right? If you look out for me, for myself, and for, for I, then I'll be happy. But ironically, the pursuit of joy says that you find joy not in looking for your own happiness, but in attending to the needs of others. 
I can't tell you how many times I've counseled people who are struggling with depression and they're, they're really just battling and, and they're, they're really kind of internally focused to begin to find somewhere to serve because something extraordinary happens when we start to think about people beyond ourselves. It begins to change our internal disposition. We begin to find this joy bubbling up inside of us. And so sometimes the answer isn't just self-actualization or self-realization or self-fulfillment. Sometimes it's, it's stopping to think about yourself and beginning to think about others. That's what joy does. It, it brings unity through our humility as we are aware of each other and focus on each other's needs. And finally, unity unleashes joy. Unity unleashes joy. If you've lost your joy, it could be because there's a breakdown relationally in your life you haven't addressed. Sometimes to rediscover the joy that's missing in our lives, we need to go back and say, where have my relationships broken down? Again, we referenced this verse in the beginning, but David said in Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And it ends with, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. And once again, nothing unifies us like the body of Christ. When we come to this table and we remember that Jesus' body was broken for us and his blood was shed for us, we remember how much we have in common with one another we remember how much we've been forgiven, which enables us to extend forgiveness to those in our life who maybe don't even deserve it. But we recognize that we also didn't deserve it when Jesus came and died for us while we were yet sinners. While we were still far from him, he died for us. And so we remind ourselves that, that God commands a blessing where his church is unified. And this, this sacrament of sharing the Lord's table together brings us into that place of unity. So I'm gonna invite the worship team to come back up for a moment. And before we come to this table together this morning, I want us just to sit quietly with the Lord and ask ourselves a few questions. So we think about how there is joy in our unity. And how Paul desperately longed for the church in Philippi to be united. How Jesus prayed for his followers to be united as one. To share one heart, one mind, the fellowship of the spirit, tenderness and compassion amongst each other. Let me just ask you some questions as we reflect together for a moment. Number one, is there a relational breakdown somewhere in your life that is robbing you of your joy? Is there someone that you're on the outs with? Maybe somewhere along the way you let a situation become more important than a relationship and that relationship has deteriorated and there's a great distance between you. Maybe you're not experiencing the fullness of joy that God has for you because there's this relational breakdown? Is there an area in your own life where you've been so focused on pursuing your own interests that you've neglected the interest of those closest to you? And what might the Lord wanna to speak to you today about joy through unity? I'm just gonna take a moment and wait quietly in the presence of God and invite him to speak to us, invite his spirit to reveal to our hearts how he wants us to respond to this word today. So Lord, would you come now and speak to our hearts? Open our ears to hear from you, Lord. When it comes to experiencing and rediscovering our joy through unity, what would you say to me this morning, Lord? What would you say to us this morning, God? Speak now, Father. Your servants are listening.